Good evening. Welcome to Making Waves. My name is Bonnie Levison and I am going to be your guide for a very special evening in honor of the Egan Maritime Institute. Obviously, because of the world today, we couldn't hold the incredible benefit that we were going to hold. So we've given you a break. You don't have to get all dressed up. You don't even have to leave your house. All I know is that you're gonna have a good time tonight because we're gonna have an evening of sharks, songs, and specialty drinks. And I am here with bartender extraordinaire, Ryan Lanigan. And Ryan, what are you gonna do for us tonight? Today I'll be mixing up the Maritime on the Rocks cocktail. Um, that cocktail contains the Willa organic vodka. Um, this is made here right on the island as well as the Triple Eight blueberry vodka. The Triple uh, Eight blueberry we've been making since the early 2000s. Um, this one was a fairly recent product we made over uh, the quarantine and shelter in place period um, as a small local in initiative to be able to support uh, island families and people in the service industry that were out of work. That's wonderful, wow. <laughs> so we'll start by making the cocktail here. we we'll fill a cup with ice, fill a shaker with ice, and then we'll go for equal parts, Willow Vodka and Triple Eight Blueberry. Um, we're gonna top it off with a bit of lemonade, some lemon juice. Throw a little mint sprig in there for good measure. Give it a quick shake. Strain it over that fresh ice, on an extra cold. Mm. Now that is Nantucket Red. Wow, that's beautiful. If anybody's ever wondered what Nantucket Red really looks like, that's the color. So we're gonna garnish it with a lemon wheel, fresh mint sprig, and it's ready to enjoy. That looks delicious, can I? You have to. Mm. Part of the job, people. Somebody's gotta do it. Oh. Delicious. Okay, guys, we are gonna continue on our journey. I think we should go to the other end of the island now that we've had our cocktail. Hopefully you've got your cocktail. And we're gonna to go to the other end of the island and visit the Shipwreck and Lifesaving Museum. again everybody I hope you enjoyed our time at Cisco Brewery I know I did and now that you all know how to make our special drink the Maritime on the Rocks and I know I've enjoyed drinking a Maritime on the Rocks I thought what better place could we go next than to the beautiful shipwreck and life-saving museum and I am with the woman that runs that entire ship the executive director of the Egan Maritime Institute Pauline Proach thank you for having me to this special special place can you just tell us about all the many programs that you have. I would love to. Um, first of all, thank you for being part of our virtual event tonight. Um, we're at the Shipwreck and Life Saving Museum. Um, Egan Maritime started off um, when Bud Egan uh, began the foundation. Nat Philbrick was our first executive director. And then around 2004, we were asked if we would come together with a life saving museum. And so um, our board of directors uh, did so. And we closed and uh, did a wonderful renovation of the beautiful building and reopened in 2008 and renamed it the life Sa Shipwreck and Life Saving Museum. It is such a beautiful, beautiful place. And I, I have to say on a personal note, my mother um, would come here on her bike every single week and just fell in love with this place. So on a personal note, this, this spot is really an oasis for me and my whole family. And I'm just so appreciative that you guys have kept it so beautiful and so magical. And what I really love about it are the exhibits take you back in time. And there's so many amazing stories that are told through imagery and actually through words. Can you tell us about some that you think are pretty special? Absolutely. I mean, just the, the courageous acts that happened, the heroism, the, the, there is a saying of you had to go out, but you don't have to come back. And that really was a true message of our rescuers. Um, the H.B. Kirkham, uh, the Andrea Doria, we tell stories um, about her. And, in fact, quite recently we had an exhibit of the Andrea Doria and it was really fascinating because we had people get in touch with us who'd either been on the boat or had relatives that were on the boat. And then we um, had a gentleman um, who actually was on the boat and was responsible for saving many uh, children, um, rescuing them and getting them onto the lifeboat. So we had him out at our Lifesavers Recognition Day. 
Um, it's just wonderful. It's 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 um, as some of the subjects and stories are tragic. Uh, it is truly wonderful to tell these heartfelt stories um, of our important history. And we have over 750 shipwrecks that we know about around the island of Nantucket, which is shocking. Yeah, it's incredibly special. Um, anything else you want to let us know about? So we have a couple of other programs that we, we do. We have AccWeather, which is a free um, free app. It's a weather app. And we, um, well, you know nobody on Nantucket cares about the weather. Never. No one ever Never. checks the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we also about, I think about 2011, our board of directors, um, they were really happy with the way that Mill Hill Press was going and the museum, the Shipwreck and Life Saving Museum and Weather was up and running, but they really wanted to make a difference to the island youth. So we built the program uh, in beginning 2012 and we've been with the public and private schools since then. We have taught in both the sixth grade and the eighth grade. The last five years we've had a core class in the eighth grade, it's an oceanography and maritime studies program. And uh, we're also uh, working with Andrew Vaselli and his students in the high school and we hope to start a boat building program with his students. Well, speaking of boat building, I have to tell you one of my favorite uh, events to read about um, over in the sort of off, slightly off season is this wonderful event you came up with, which is the is it the cardboard box boat race? <laughs> yes. Is that what that is? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it's the yes cardboard boat race, and that happens in the fall. Um, we started that when we used to run the Maritime Festival and um, we'd invite students to participate but we also realized that we would hold that on the weekend and not all of the students who had made a boat and participated in it through the building process had an opportunity to race it. So we changed to doing it at the end of September, beginning of October, as long as our uh, harbour master Sheila Lucy would allow us because <laughs> the weather gets a bit dodgy. You don't mess with her. You, no, you don't mess you with don't. Sheila. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we now have it as an eighth grade project. So they have two days to build the cardboard boats and we put them in mixed teams so they're not necessarily working with their peers. And then, um, a few days later, we launched them down at Children's Beach, and that is a hoot. So Pauline, these children go out on the links for a full week? They do, yes. Amazing. We um, do a presentation at the school each year, and we ask students to do a, a very basic application, because we're really looking for any student who's interested, who's willing to take the challenge of being on a tour ship as crew for a week. And so um, we're not looking for students necessarily who have sailing experience, but are up for the challenge. Oh, that is so exciting. And, and I have to just say, I'm sure some people think that the Egan Maritime Institute Lynx is a golf course. It is not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it is a boat and it's spelled differently. Yes. But my goodness, you are touching so many young people's lives here and creating new futures for them, which we're going to learn a little bit more about. Yes. So we have a next stop to go to. We, we, we see that your reach is wide and you are in the classroom. You are near the water and you are also on the water. Yes. So why don't we go see the links? I'd love to. Chloe, thank you for joining us today. Could you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Chloe Plank. Um, I'm 23 years old and I was born and raised on Nantucket, fortunately enough. All right, wonderful. I understand that you had a very transformative first experience sailing aboard the Lynx. Could you please tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, so um, I first became connected to Egan Maritime. It was the end of my junior year in high school and Egan Maritime partnered with Lynx Educational Foundation and they came to our school um, and they said, we have this amazing opportunity. They showed us a video of uh, the Tall Ship Link sailing. Um, they said, it's gonna be a week long in the summer, fill out an application. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to be on that ship this summer. Um, so I did fill out that application and I, I got on um, the week long voyage. We sailed from Nantucket to Mystic, Connecticut and back. Um, and Lynx is an 1812 privateer as hope, I think everyone knows. Um, and it was just an amazing experience. The crew was amazing. The, the platform, the education was amazing. Um, just like the individual experience, like on board, the things that happened were amazing. So it was really wonderful. Awesome. 
that's fantastic. Um, Chloe, please tell us a little bit about how Sea of Opportunities helped you make the decision to go to a Maritime Academy. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Sea of Opportunities really helped me become more aware of alternative career paths and also of um, alternative educational institutions. So during my high school experience, I found that most of my mentors and my teachers and just the adults in general had a very similar um, experience in life in general, kind of in a similar path. And so the um, guidance that they could afford me or the, the insight was very much, um, it created sort of a, a lackluster tunnel vision. Um, so for my peers and, and myself, for some of my peers. So I really like, it was very, was very dispassionate about, you know, going through the motions throughout high school um, and see of opportunities really, they, um, open my eyes to there's this different path you can take. You don't have to, even though you have this amazing experience on links, you don't necessarily have to do exactly that. There are other, other, other opportunities. Um, Mass Maritime um, has a lot of opportunities within. Um, and I think like Sea of Opportunities really took me away from that one path that everyone in high school is like, okay, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna go to college and this is how it's gonna happen, so. Awesome. Awesome. We um, that's what we we like to hear. We we want you students to know that there's a there's a whole other world out there, and especially in this field and growing up in Nantucket in a coastal community, that there are this whole other arena of possibilities. And uh, you have done such a great job. Big congratulations, Chloe, on graduating this year from Mass Maritime Academy. Could you please tell us a little bit about the license and the certification that you're graduating with? and what your plans are for future employment. Yeah, so um, I graduated this past June. Um, I passed my Coast Guard license test, so now I have my third mate's unlimited tonnage license. So that means I can be a third officer on any ship in the world, anywhere in the world. Um, and with that, I also have my 1600 ton chief mate's license, so I can be a chief mate anywhere on a 1600 ton ship. And I also have my 100 ton masters, so I can be a captain on a 100 ton ship. So there are a ton of endorsements that I have left Mass Maritime with. Um, I feel very fortunate and it's crazy. Um, but um, so yeah, last fall, a company that I had interned with called Military Sealift Command, I had done my internship with them and their whole mission is that they are supply ships um, for our Navy. So our federal government owns the ship and then this company staffs the ship and oversees um, its uh, travel and arrangement with other Navy ships. So they bring everything from um, food, pens, um, fuel and ammo and missiles, anything the Navy needs, these ships bring it to the ships and the Navy bases. So anywhere in the world that a Navy ship or base is, is where I will end up. Um, so yeah, I, I interviewed in the uh, fall in November and I knew that I had uh, the position. Um, and so now I'm, I'm on my way down to Virginia to get my final little certifications done and hop on a ship. That is fantastic. That sounds really cool. I can't imagine the places you're gonna go and the things that you're gonna see and uh, I know that in this career, you know, one experience leads to another experience and you have a, you just have a really wonderful future ahead of you. So I'm really happy for you. With me today is Phaedra Plank. Phaedra, thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Please tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, so my name is Phaedra Plank. Um, I'm 18 years old and I was born and raised here on the lovely Nantucket Island. And I will soon be leaving to, uh, for the first time uh, to go to college, so. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Phaedra, you are one of our Sea of Opportunities alumni, student Mariner graduates. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your first experience with Sea of Opportunities. Well, to be honest, I don't think I can pinprick my uh, first time interacting with Egan Maritime and Sea of Opportunities because they have been such a constant presence in my life um, from the, my earliest memories. Um, my sister um, became involved at, with Egan Maritime when she started working and um, 
go uh, joining the crew of the Lynx. Mm -hmm. um, and I um, had the opportunity to visit the Life Saving Museum and go on uh, our trips on the links from a very young age. From sixth grade, we were participating in maritime classes that were sponsored by Egan Maritime. Yep. And um, so really, they've been a constant presence throughout my schooling and my personal life, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, what was one of your most memorable Sea of Opportunities experiences? Well, following my sister's experiences on the links, she shared her enthusiasm with me. So I also had the uh, unique opportunity of sailing on the tall ship links. Um, and I was actually only supposed to be on the links for five days, um, but we ended up getting stuck in Martha's Vineyard, Edgartown Harbor, uh, where I sprained my ankle and uh, got to steer the ship all the way home all by myself. Um, well, not by myself, but um, so I think that was probably one of the most memorable experiences. Um, of course, as I mentioned, I have so many various memories from all the years um, of getting to do hands-on experiences every day in, in class. Um, and um, so, I mean, getting to sail on the tall ship was most memorable simply in that I did things I'd never done before, like climbing the rigging to the top of the mast, which was frankly terrifying, but a wonderful experience. <laughs> and, um, but I'd say the links was probably the most memorable. That's wonderful. That's that's great. A lot of our student mariners say that, and we're yeah. so lucky to have that vessel that comes to Nantucket. I would agree. Awesome. Um, first of all, big congratulations. You are this year's recipient of the Nantucket Golf Club Foundation Scholarship, Thanks which so is much. an amazing accomplishment. Um, and you are going off to college this coming year. Can you think of any any way of how Sea of Opportunities helped you along that path to where you are today? I know you touched yeah. on a little bit before, but right. as far as where you are today and, and how Sea of Opportunities helped you get to where you are. Um, I'm definitely, I think it's, it's hard to uh, pinprick exactly, but there's something about getting a uh, hands-on experience with the ocean and um, relying on your fellow classmates in a way that you never would in a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that I think stimulates your brain more and uh, gives you a better connection to learning. Um, one issue that a lot of kids have and a reason they have trouble staying focused in school is that they don't see how the things they're learning connect to the real world. Yep. You know, there's the common, you're in math, you say, how, when, when am I ever gonna use fractions in real life, you know? Right, right. And um, that's something that you, you can't say when you're on the links or when you're, out here in the life ship and um, life ship saving museum because you see how it's connected to the real world and world and you see how um, valuable skills like teamwork and cooperation and um, critical thinking and problem solving how those are critical and how you can apply them to the real life so even if you don't end up pursuing a maritime field like my sister did mm -hmm. i'm going into a liberal arts education yep. um, i think um, getting to be in, in uh, you know, such a hands-on um, uh, experience was really vital and just helping me connect my experiences in the classroom to the real world, especially. Awesome. The lights in the harbor Rescue 
Next up, we have a real treat for you. We have Dr. Gregory Skomel. He is a marine biologist, underwater explorer, photographer, and author. He is the shark expert, and he's gonna give you a wonderful presentation. Greg heads up the Massachusetts Shark Research Program. He's also adjunct faculty scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He has written dozens of scientific research papers. He's appeared in a number of film and television documentaries, including programs for National Geographic, Discovery Channel, and the BBC. He is the Cape's foremost expert on great white sharks. We are incredibly fortunate to have him with us. And I don't know about you, but next time I'm at the beach, I want him with me. This talk is uh, called Living with White Sharks because as our environment changes here on Cape Cod, specifically around the Outer Cape, as well as Nantucket and the Vineyard, we're seeing more and more seals. And as a result of that, we're seeing more and more white sharks. And so what we have to learn to do is, is live with these white sharks and coexist with these white sharks. Um, the white shark is a, a charismatic species. We're all familiar with it because of popular films. Um, but also realize it is a top predator in the world's oceans. And what's really unique about this predator is it's, it's large, it's powerful, and as it gets bigger, as it gets older, it has the capacity to hunt and kill bigger prey. It also scavenges whale carcasses. And the bigger prey that, uh, that white sharks target is typically seals, sea lions in other parts of the world, as well as dolphins and porpoises. And so the, the white shark as a top predator will target these species as it gets larger and wherever these animals live if the environment is compatible with them. What many of you have noticed over the years, and certainly it's, it's no secret, is that seal populations are coming back to Cape Cod, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, really all of the Gulf of Maine, including Canadian waters. And that's because of protection that was put in place back in 1972 that allowed these populations to recover after very, very high levels of, of overfishing. Um, we had actually driven most seal populations to the brink of extinction. And now with almost 50 years of protection, they've come back and they've come back in big numbers. Well, now that we have these big numbers of seals, we also have these big numbers of white sharks that are coming back to feed on these seals. What's really quite fascinating is these, uh, this whole dynamic of sharks and seals and the predator-prey relationship is unfolding really close to shore. And it's happening every day along the uh, coast of Massachusetts, and specifically in those areas where there's high densities of seals. So in this photograph, you see a white shark hunting very, very close to shore. This was taken uh, just off of, off of Monomoy Island, which is the elbow of Cape Cod. But anywhere you see seals piled up on the beaches or close to shore, you're also going to see during certain months of the year, specifically the summer and early fall, white sharks coming in close to shore to hunt these seals. But we also have another dynamic. We have people who love to recreate in these areas, um, whether it be surfing, scuba diving, paddle boarding, boogie boarding. We have now uh, the overlap of this predator-prey relationship with uh, human activities, human recreational and commercial activities. And so this presents, obviously, some, somewhat of a public safety issue. And yes, we have seen an increase in the number of interactions, specifically negative interactions between sharks and people in recent years. We had kayakers that were struck by a white shark off of Plymouth. We've had uh, surfers and swimmers um, that have encountered white sharks. And specifically in 2018, we had two swimmers bitten and one of those bites was, was fatal. And so as a result of this dynamic that's unfolding right here in our waters, we've really begun to focus on this predator-prey relationship to get a a better idea of when, where, and how white sharks are hunting seals. If we can better understand that, we're firmly convinced 
that if we can find patterns in that behavior, you know, is there a specific time of day? Is there a specific tide? You know, is a, a specific lunar phase? Whatever it is, if we can find those patterns, we'll be able to identify those areas or those times that people should avoid using the shoreline or certain parts of the shoreline. And so this research for us has really intensified over the last year. And we're using a variety of methods and almost all of them involve some level of tracking the movements of white sharks. And we started tagging white sharks back in um, 2009. And since then, we have tagged over 200, actually we're up to about 220 uh, individual white sharks off the coast of Cape Cod, as well as off the southeastern United States. And so what these tags are telling us, not only where they go over broader scales, but also what they're doing at finer scales. When do they arrive in Massachusetts? Where do they spend their time? When do they leave Massachusetts? And where do they go when they leave? We're starting to answer those questions, but beyond those questions, we're also very much interested and not necessarily what they do from week to week, but also what they're doing from minute to minute, second to second. How are they interacting with their prey in shallow water? So this video right now shows a, our typical tagging technique. And what we do with our tagging is we try to minimize any kind of invasive nature to it. We're not capturing these fish. We're not... Uh, dragging them through the water. What we're doing is we're just placing a tag at the base of the dorsal fin using a small intramuscular dart. So what you see in this video is me on the end of the pulpit. The shark has been identified by a spotter pilot in the air named Wayne Davis. Wayne has put us on this shark. Captain John King has it. We're following it. It's just below me in that gray shadow and you're going to see me place the tag right at the base of the dorsal fin right there using a tagging needle. And this will give you a close-up of it as well right here. The tag is blue, and you can see the shark swim away right after we tag it. So this is a very, very effective technique that we use to tag white sharks without excessive handling, without trying to modify their behavior. And the specific tag that I just put on that shark is called an acoustic tag. And the way the acoustic tag works is it emits a very, very high frequency sound that's picked up by an array of acoustic receivers that I've put out all over Massachusetts. So this next video I'm going to show you is an actual animation of what that acoustic array looks like off the coast of Cape Cod. And each one of the yellow dots in this animation is basically an acoustic receiver. And anytime one of these sharks swims within the range of this acoustic receiver, we're able to get a sense of where, when, and who that shark is. So the receiver detects the sound from that shark, decodes who that shark is, and then logs that information. We then go collect the receivers at the end of the year, and we can see those areas of, that the white sharks are hanging out in. We also know when they arrive and when they leave, so we can also determine the seasonality of the sharks arriving. And so it's a very effective method to monitor those locations, those specific areas, whether it be swimming beaches, areas with lots of seals, you name it, where we can see whether or not white sharks are spending any amount of time. So the data that are coming from these tags are very amazing because they give us all this information about these sharks and we can start piecing together a picture of, of white shark habitat use in Massachusetts. So this next video is uh, an animation that shows you the arrival of white sharks in Massachusetts, where they spend their time and when they leave. And what I want you to see in this animation is an upper left-hand corner of, above the graphic is the date and this is these are actual data that we collected in june of 2019 and this is uh going to be what we call a bubble a bubble figure each one of the white dots represents an acoustic receiver and as these white dots turn different colors and begin to swell it gives you a sense of the number of white sharks the number of detections of white sharks of tagged white sharks 
the bigger the dot, the more white sharks in that area. So we can begin to walk through the season of 2019 as you can see that the sharks begin to arrive in June to late June and the numbers begin to increase. And you can see it's most of this is happening in Cape Cod Bay, the eastern portion of Cape Cod Bay, and specifically along the outer Cape. So those big bubbles that you see is a growing presence of white sharks. But you can see a lot of the white dots, particularly off on the south shore or up toward Boston, they just don't light up that much because the sharks aren't utilizing those areas. As we get into August, September, and October, we see the numbers really increase because those are peak months for white sharks. And then as we get into early November, temperatures begin to cool down and the white sharks start to leave. And certainly by mid-December, they're all gone. So we can see in this little animation what happens in terms of the arrival of these sharks and the fact that they spend their time once they get here along the outer Cape and the eastern shoreline of Cape Cod of Bay. And that's because that's where the seals are. They're there to feed on the seals. The other technology that we're using it involves putting very specific camera tags. So we have a sense of the seasonality. We know they're spending time along the outer Cape and the eastern side of Cape Cod Bay. So now what are they doing, not from day to day, but from minute to minute, or even second to second? And we can get those kind of, that kind of information from data collected by a specific kind of tagging technology called acceleration data loggers. And the way acceleration data loggers work is they collect information data every second on the movement of that shark through the water column. And so the first thing you see here in this slide is uh, an acceleration data logger being towed by a white shark. We placed this on a white shark in 2019. What's really cool about these tags too is they have camera systems in them. So we not only get a snapshot into how that shark is behaving, how it's moving, whether it's speeding up or slowing down, whether it's turning right or left, going up or down, what the depth of that shark is with the water temperature of that shark. But we're also getting actual video observations provided by the camera tag. So after a day or two on the shark, this tag comes off, floats to the surface, we collect it, we download all that information, and we can get a sense of what that shark is doing in three-dimensional space every second. This produces millions of data points that we can then assemble to recreate the movements of that animal. And so what I've got next is a video actually collected by one of these tags. And you will notice that it's fairly boring to look at, but what I want you to see on the left side of the screen is uh, data actually collected by the tag that shows the depth of the shark, the temperature of the shark, and then its acceleration in three-dimensional space in the three graphics below it. So this is the movement of a shark through the water column as captured by the camera itself. And what you're going to see is this particular shark, his name is Scarface, is suddenly going to explode and accelerate. And what it's doing is accelerating toward the surface. So you'll see the depth change as well. The depth will suddenly go up. Uh, the temperature will change moderately, but also we'll see a spike in acceleration in those three graphs below. And what this tells us is this shark was likely attempting to feed on something, maybe going after a seal at the surface. But this is just a tiny little snapshot, 35 seconds in the life of a, a shark. But it gives us a glimpse into how this shark is attempting to feed, when it is attempting to feed, how often it feeds, where it's feeding, and if we can put all that information together, we can even get a sense of you know, how many seals does a white shark attempt to feed on over the course of the summer? Actually, how often does it succeed? How many would it ultimately eat? Basic questions about how, when, and where white sharks feed on seals. And so what we do is we've been able to take these data, put them all together, and show you how they can be assembled to recreate the actual movements of that animal in three-dimensional space. So this last animation, again, shows the data stream on the left side of the screen, and this shark just cruising in hunting mode. But suddenly we're gonna see in the data, as well as in the camera, just like I showed you, this shark accelerate toward the surface, go after a couple of seals, in this case, miss, 
and then settle back down and go into a routine patrolling or hunting pattern. So it gives you a great example of how we can assemble the data collected from the tag to actually recreate and animate the behavior of the white shark. Ultimately, what all this information do is answer that basic question that tells us about this predator-prey relationship. Will we be able to see what are the environmental conditions that will precipitate a shark attack on a seal? What, where does that happen? When does that happen? You know, what is the seal doing at that time? All information we're trying to assemble from our tagging technology. Because ultimately, our goal is to recreate the movements of these animals in three-dimensional space and have some predictive force, some modeling that we'll be able to do and ultimately allow us to forecast those areas or those times when people might be more vulnerable to a shark bite. That's what we want to avoid. So we're sharing all this information with public safety officials uh, so that we can ultimately um, provide the kinds of data, do the kinds of studies that might be able to save a life. Um, so this, this is information that is, you know, it's really a, a research project we're just starting. We initiated it in 2019. We're going to be continuing it through this summer, 2020, and hopefully for the next three summers. We have a, a student from the University of New England we're collaborating with. We're collaborating also with the Center for Coastal Studies as well as the New England Aquarium on all this work. So that, that through this collaborative effort, we'll be able to produce information ultimately that will help with public safety. So stay, stay tuned, you know, this is information that hopefully we'll, uh, we'll assemble over time. And ultimately, maybe I'll come back to, to Egan and present it uh, a year or two from now. So thanks for your time. Um, I'll gladly entertain any questions and I really appreciate you watching. Take care. So my name is Paul Gazik, and I'm here today to speak with Greg Stommel, who is, gosh, he's the shark guy. Uh, I, I don't know, I can't overstate it. He's uh, he's really been riding herd on on the largest and the newest great white shark hotspot uh, in the world off Chatham, but more, he's really plugged into the whole East Coast great white phenomenon which has been evolving and changing through time over the last few years so anyway i'm gonna I, greg how are you did you go out today hi, hi paul it's great to see you um actually i was out on orleans beach testing some new aerial technology so um cool uh, a, a blimp system that captures footage uh from the air of the ocean so it was uh, it was kind of a fun test but it it, uh, it had me scrambling today well, I saw there have been a lot of uh, there have been a lot of hits uh, just in the last week or so. A lot of sightings. Uh, my Sharktivity app has been you know blowing up. So a lot of suddenly the sharks were around. They they seem to be not around for a while, and now they seem to be around. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think a lot has to do with the fact that we put out some receivers that are extremely uh, brand new, and they report information in real time. To, uh, to the general public. And so that has increased the number of reports. So otherwise, we're pretty much on schedule. You know, it is August. It is considered one of the peak months of, uh, of the season for white sharks, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So Greg, I, so I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, about the life. You know, we're, we're, this is, uh, you know, Egan Maritime Institute's mission is uh, about oceanic sciences and, and education for for students, uh, for Nantucket students, but I, I think I think it's more than a job. You know, when you go to sea, it's more than a job. It's an adventure, and I wonder if you could just talk about the life. What what what's the life on the ocean like? When you go to sea, you're doing. It's more than just you're embracing almost a way of life. Would you agree? Yeah, Paul, and I think you know it as, as well as I do because of your experiences. You know, it's 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 not just a job, what, what we do. It is uh, really something we're dedicated to. Um, 
and we love we we embrace what we do and and being on the ocean is is where we you know um are happiest really and so um it, it's a life it's a lifestyle that that i love and that a lot of other scientists and fishermen and others who spend time on the ocean love um and it's a commitment you know it's it's you know my first marriage was to the ocean <laughs> and uh and <laughs> thankfully my wife understands that <laughs> <Phew>. <laughs> So, so if you're a young person today uh, and you want to get started with marine biology or in the ocean sciences, what's the way, what's the way in? Because I, I, that's what I hear from young people. You know, uh, I, I had a long career in television. Everybody wants to know, you know, how I got the job. How did I get in? What was my path? What was your path into your work? Well, you know, it was, uh, you know, it started in high school. Um, I was passionate about the ocean and and wanted to learn more about it, and so you know it's not like there are specialty courses in high school, but you know I I studied biology and I embraced biology and and when I went on to the University of Rhode Island, I decided you know there's a whole bunch of kids around me that want to be marine scientists and and I don't want to necessarily blend in with them. I want to I want to excel, and so what I did was I started taking graduate level coursework by my third year at the university and I got to know my professors really well and and I was doing research with them on on aspects of, of biology that I had seriously no real interest in uh, you know my professor in, at the University of Rhode Island <laughs> as an undergrad my advisor he studied eels and tiny little fish called sticklebacks and I'm thinking this this isn't what interests me but I'm gonna learn something and I committed myself to to getting to know, to know these professors and, and working hard, and then began volunteering, you know, at labs, laboratories, and learning about various aspects of, of how to conduct research. And so that's how it kicked off, really through, you know, trying hard, trying to set myself aside from others, and uh, getting to networking, which uh, I'm, I'm certain you understand, you know, you have to yeah. do that in almost any job, and then, um, you know, volunteering at labs. So this is a this is a kind of kind of a common obvious question, but I, I think it bears asking and answering, and, and that is, you know, why why should we care about sharks? You know, why are they important to the planet? I mean, and how? It's a it's a great question. You know, when I was a young kid, nobody really cared about them. You know, no, everyone was basically saying the only good shark was a dead shark. Why should we protect something that? eats us, you know, which was, you know, a misconception back then. And, and the truth of the matter is, the more we get to know about shark species, the more we realize that they are important uh, components of a natural, well-balanced marine ecosystem. For the most part, most shark species fulfill the role of a top predator. They're at the top of the food web. And we need those top predators, just like we need the, you know, the lower levels of the food web. So to maintain a well-balanced ecosystem we've got to have our sharks so if we start to wipe them out which we have done historically we're going to impact the overall health of our marine ecosystem uh, upon which we depend you know we we harvest a lot from the ocean and if we don't have a healthy ocean we're not going to be harvesting very much so keep our health uh, healthy oceans by keeping our sharks is there is there, is there are there one or two things that have really discoveries that you've made that have really surprised you uh, that that you were like oh my word I had no idea yeah um, there, there's a there's a few I think a couple of my favorites one one really has to do with the natural history of the shark in terms of its longevity I'm working with a colleague of mine Lisa Nate Hansen we use the vertebral banding pattern in the vertebrae, the backbones of the sharks. We counted rings on backbone on the backbones of white sharks, and we learned that uh, they, they're one of the longest-lived fish species, exceeding over 70 years in terms of longevity, and that really blew my mind. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> previous, previous estimates had them living 30, 40 years max, and so mm. wow. it really changes the way you look at an animal, too. When, you, when they live longer. You know, if an animal lives for two weeks, you, you know, it's typically a bug, you don't think much of it. If you've got an animal, a vertebrate that lives over 70, 75 years, you, you view them differently. 
Well, it's uh, not a I, trivial life. It's not. It's it's a no. significant life. It is, and and it and I think experience plays into it in terms of the sharks themselves, and 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 how they behave from year to year, and the fact that they can do things over and over again repeatedly. Um, comes from their own experiences and their own ability to remember to do these things. And, and, and one of the things we discovered that surprised, really surprised me is prior to you know, the invention of these sophisticated satellite tags, we, um, we thought that the white sharks were largely restricted to the continental shelf, which is that, you know, that mm. narrow band of shallow water that extends out from the east coast. Um, but what we learned from this technology is that there's an oceanic component to white shark movement. Oh where they wander as far as the Azores, diving to depths as great as 3,000 feet every day. And nobody knew this about white sharks in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and that just you know, totally blew our minds because we thought they were a coastal shark really focused on dolphins, porpoises, whale carcasses, seals. But they're wandering out in the middle of the Atlantic. And of course, that begs the question, why? And we can't answer that. Right. They, they are the most mysterious creature in the ocean, I think. And of course, we're limited by battery life, you know, in a way. I mean, that's that's all, with, as long as the battery will last, uh, that's, that's all we can know. You know, you've got a lot of stories. How about a story? Anybody who works at sea has a good story or two. I mean, uh, have you ever had the pants scared off you or, uh, or do you have a good story, some fantastic thing that happened that was completely out of left field? That, because that's that's also part of working in the ocean. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. And you know, when I'm put on the spot, I you know all these stories jump into my head, and I'm trying to figure out the one. Most of them really don't have to do with any danger associated with the sharks themselves. Even though you may recall that that famous video of a white shark jumping up at the pulpit after me. Uh, yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> and I gotta say, that, was, that was indeed a high anxiety moment. And, and you then nearly got a pedicure. <laughs> with that? You nearly got a pedicure. Yeah, yeah, that, I did the white shark, I invented the white shark shuffle that day uh, when I danced on the pulpit as this thing came up. It was the first time I've ever looked right down into the mouth and down the throat of a white shark. And I don't think I ever want to see that again. No, no. <laughs> So, so Greg, really, to kind of go at this career, if you call it a career, it's a frame of mind as well. You know, I, sometimes I tell, I have some students too, and I tell them develop the habit of curiosity. And I'm wondering if that's good advice for marine sciences as well. Paul, well, that is really excellent advice, you know, this I, when I work with graduate students or even undergraduate students at, at colleges and universities with which I'm affiliated, including UMass, um, I can see those students that have this natural, you know, knack for curiosity, how to ask a question, how to show some interest in something. Those kids jump out at me, and those are the ones that are most attractive to me in terms of a future in this field, you know, developing right. that sense of curiosity and I don't care how dumb you think that question is you know there's no such thing as a dumb question you know and even the questions that seem to be so simple are yet so complex we don't have answers to them. so you nailed it right on the head there this, this cu curiosity factor really plays into it well thank you Greg it's been a great it's been great chatting with you uh, and I think uh, a lot of people think that you, you know, people look at you and think, God, he's got such a great job. But these jobs, you know, just you got to try hard and go for it. And I think, I think that really came through today. I want to thank you very much and happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. It's really great to see you again, and it's great to have this opportunity to speak to everybody. But uh, you know, you don't have to study marine science. There could be other aspects that you love, but the, the bottom line is chase your dream. It's, you may just catch it.
are standing here in front of the beautiful Folgers Marsh, which is adjacent to the Shipwreck and Lifesaving Museum, and I am with the President Emeritus of the Egan Maritime Institute, Bob Egan. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, I Bonnie. guess you're, you you should be me. welcoming me. You're having ah, me to no, this absolutely great. beautiful place. Oh, thank you. People do seem to enjoy it. So the name Egan sounds familiar. A lot of Egan's running around. A lot of Egan's. Yeah, and Egan Maritime really started with my uncle Buddy Egan, who used to own Marine Home Center, uh, and my aunt Dorothy, uh, who also has her own foundation called the Dorothy Harrison Egan Foundation. Mm. And those that that foundation offers scholarships, medical scholarships to kids who want to go off island and learn some kind of medical, and. Uh, they give out quite a few scholarships as well. So there are two separate foundations. One is the Dor Dorothy Harris Negan, and then this one that we're involved with is the, is, the, uh, is the Egan Maritime. Well, we're so grateful to your aunt and uncle for being so generous to start this organization. Yeah. Um, and we're also grateful to you because you have a true passion for it. So Bob, obviously this is a virtual fundraiser. <laughs> so what would you like our viewers to know? Well, thanks, Bonnie. I, what I would like people to know is that Having the opportunity for people to come to this museum, as you can see, it's a beautiful structure. It's Nantucket. It requires a lot of maintenance. It requires staff. And to get people of all ages into this museum requires funding. Also, the Sea of Opportunities program, which is our maritime studies curriculum in the school system, also requires teachers, which are not inexpensive, and it requires staff to administer these programs. We really strongly feel that when you donate to Egan Maritime, you are helping the youth of the island in a significant way. And we also think that you're enhancing the experience, not only of local people who come to the museum, but also summer visitors who, who, who often come and enjoy themselves. So we ask that you give as much as you can, as generously as you can. Any amount is great. We have broad support in the community and we would love to have your support. Some days 
days we're catching whales, my boys. Some days we're catching none. With a 20 foot oar held in me hands from four o'clock in the morning. And as the shades of night came down, we'd rest on our weary oars. Twas then that I wished that I was dead, so I'd go to sea no more. No more, boys, no more. It's go to sea no more. Twas then that I wished that I was dead, so I'd go to sea no more. you, Bonnie, but I'm feeling a little lightheaded. Me too. We are at the top of Great Point yes, Lighthouse. I know. Look at this view. It's so windy. <laughs> <laughs> but of course we're not. We're right here at this amazing exhibit at the yes. Shipwreck and Lifesaving Museum, another great feature of the Egan Maritime Institute. And we, I've just had so much fun learning about all the programs that you have and that you run. Can you tell us how people can get involved, um, how much it costs? Well, actually, um, only the museum has an admissions fee. Everything else that we do is free. So all of the education programs in the schools, the Lynx program, the sailing as junior mariners, it's all free to students. So your support from donors means everything. It's critical. It, it really is. Well, I think that's a good time to, uh, to look to our audience, don't you? Yes. Please consider supporting Egan Maritime Institute to help us fund our education programs and our museum. Your gifts will make such a difference. Thank you so much. Yeah.